Hey everybody, it's Chris, and today I'm interviewing Kelly Ryerson. Kelly is also known as Glyphosate Girl. That's right. <laughs> and uh, she started a news site called Glyphosate Facts. Not, not facts machine, but facts, F-A-C-T-S, which explores and explains how our chemical agriculture system has led to an explosion in chronic disease. She collaborates with doctors, scientists, farmers, and other companies to address the agrochemical damage to our soil and our bodies. And um, she's not the first person I've interviewed uh, talking about glyphosate. I also, if some of you may remember, my interview with Dr. Stephanie Seneff from N MIT, who has uh, you know, been sounding the alarm about glyphosate for, for many years. So I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation with you, Kelly, and, and so welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Stephanie is awesome. I'm glad you had her on. She was one of the very first people I turned to when my eyes started to be open to, to the glyphosate situation. So. Yeah, she's, she is uh, a brilliant, brilliant researcher and scientist. So how did this, how did your glyphosate journey begin? What prompted you to go down this rabbit hole and start <laughs> glyphosate facts? I mean, you know, it's something must have happened in your life. Yeah. You know, it's amazing. And I'm sure it's something you can relate to when illness brings you to your knees of desperation. You're never really the same person. Um, so leading up to my awakening, I was dealing with a lot of very strange physical symptoms and seeing 20 doctors and no one really having answers for me as to why I was so exhausted, why my eyesight was going, why I had rashes and um, I mean, just the list of symptoms that I was experiencing pointed to autoimmunity. I had increased autoimmune markers. Um, and it, what I didn't know at the time is that there is an explosion of autoimmunity now, and it doesn't even always fall under a specific category. Like you sometimes can't even name it. It's just things are going wrong and you're having an autoimmune reaction. So that's what was happening with me. And doctors aren't really set up to assess that necessarily. Um, and so many of them instead said that I was really anxious um, and probably depressed, and that was what was causing my physical symptoms. And I can tell you I was anxious because my body was falling apart, um, so that was accurate, but that certainly wasn't <laughs> driving the problem. Yeah. So, so Being finally, bad does create uh, stress I, and anxiety. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be kind of weird if it didn't, right? Yeah. Um, so I finally went and saw a psychiatrist who happened to have some intake blood work, um, that included vitamins. And it was, I can't believe that he did. Cause this was guy is a mainstream, like Stanford trained, uh, psychiatrist who had, I mean, at Stanford and at most medical institutions, they're not saying, Oh, go test the vitamin levels. But anyway, on his, there was vitamins and, and the scan came back that I was extremely depleted across the board with vitamins. Around that same time, my sister was diagnosed with celiac disease. I did not have celiac disease, but decided to go gluten-free anyway and slowly started to get better. So as many people are finding now, they can't tolerate gluten. And wow, you know, so many random things can go away when you have gluten. Like you get your feeling back in your hands, like the tingling goes away, all kinds of really miraculous turnarounds in health. So I was like, this is strange. Why can we suddenly not tolerate gluten as a society? And so I went to the Columbia University. Um, it was a conference symposium on celiac and gluten sensitivity with a bunch of researchers and physicians. And they're talking about, we don't know what it is. It's causing this gluten sensitivity rise. And finally, I, I went up to the microphone and I said, do they spray Roundup on the grain? The, the chemical, the, the herbicide Roundup. And doctors and researchers kind of like turned around and looked at me they're like, they don't spray Roundup, that would, that would kill it. And I was like, okay. And I went and I sat down and I felt kind of embarrassed, frankly. Um, and then a scientist from General Mills was there to promote their uh, gluten-free Cheerios. So he found me and he said, yeah, they're spraying Roundup on a lot of the grains. We know there's a problem. It's gonna take two decades to reverse. Okay, like two decades. I said, well, everyone's gonna be gluten sensitive or intolerant and maybe dead because people are getting sick from this. And who did I call up? So I'm reading through PubMed, like, okay, what research is there? And I came across Stephanie Seneff's 
research and um, Anthony Samsel, her partner. And I called her up and she's like, come visit me if you're in Boston. I was in Boston. And I went and sat down with her and she was like, let me tell you and like laid it all out. And it really sent me on a huge path of glyphosate, which I'm still working on today. Yeah. You know, I, I actually talk about this in my first book, Chris Beat Cancer, how glyphosate is used. I mean, excuse me. Um, well, glyphosate Roundup, yeah, are used as um, a desiccant to dry out grains and other produce before the harvest. And uh, yeah, people just don't know. They, they think it's just sprayed on, you know, like Roundup resistant, whatever. And um, you know, people think soy and they think corn and they think about, um, you know, canola and maybe Hawaiian papaya. And they don't realize that glyphosate's sprayed on <laughs> Tons of legumes and grains. Oh my gosh, it is all over our food supply. In fact, it's estimated that 80, actually over 80% of our dietary exposure to Roundup actually isn't from the GMOs. It's definitely from this pre-harvest desiccation practice that farmers have embraced very sadly. And what's so horrific about that, just for people that don't understand what that means, so that there's a really, it's much easier to harvest a crop when it's all evenly dried because you're not having to time things and go out and you bring your tractor and then bring it out a different day when that part of the field is ripe. So farmers will spray our grains or legumes or whatever it is with Roundup. You get an even drying and then they bring out their equipment, harvest it all in one, one swoop. And then that grain will go directly to the mills, be processed and then lands exactly in our food supply. So and it has it. You can't wash it off. It's not washed off. It's in that grain. And then we're eating it and our body pays the price for it. So what is glyphosate doing in our body? Oh my gosh. So each day a new study comes out about what glyphosate is doing in our body. But I'll just start with uh, the gut because it it's where I started in understanding what was going on. Uh, it is uh, actually works as an antibiotic. So when you're eating glyphosate covered food, it goes into your biome. And it very interestingly, I recently discovered in the last few years that it selectively kills good gut bacteria, but not bad gut bacteria. So you can land with a really huge issue with dysbiosis just simply from glyphosate alone. It also, um, and something that is really interesting and finally is coming to light, which is something Stephanie has talked about for a long time, is that it was always claimed by Monsanto, who manufactured glyphosate, that glyphosate does not impact human cells, only plant cells, because of this process, um, this pathway called the shikimate pathway, which is a metabolic process that you find in plants and fungi and, um, and actually bacteria. So now we know the importance of bacteria to our overall health. And now we know glyphosate can impact that pathway that's so critical in, in the biome and our bacteria. And not only that, but it shuts off the shikimate pathway in our bacteria, of which we are dependent on to get tryptophan, serotonin, and all of these other um, aromatic amino acids out of this process in the microbiome. So you start thinking about how often are we, or how much of the population right now is on an SSRI because we don't have enough serotonin. Well, it's interesting that this directly would cut off our source of serotonin from our microbiome. So that is one of the most interesting impacts. And actually there was a lawsuit, um, I think in 2019 that made Monsanto take and well, Bayer owns Monsanto now, make them take off the label that it doesn't impact humans because the argument was made that the biome is part of, you know, human, um, our health. So that is a step forward. We take these small wins. Um, so it, it does that. It also uh, contributes to leaky gut, which is, I believe, how I became so sick. And it can um, really, it, it detracts from the integrity of the gut lining and the tight junctions in our intestine, which is probably something you guys talk about a lot. Good things that, I mean, bad things that are inside the intestine leak out into the bloodstream and wreak havoc throughout the body and things and toxins that shouldn't ever get outside of the intestine are now floating around the body. Glyphosate itself has now been shown to cross the blood brain barrier and potentially have a link with Alzheimer's development. Glyphosate has no business being in the brain. 
I actually sent out three sperm samples as well to see semen samples to see if glyphosate was in those semen samples. And indeed it was. So we know that glyphosate can cause um, early sperm death and lower the motility of sperm. And it is crossing that barrier that's never supposed to be crossed. Yet you'll see headlines. We don't know why fertility is decreasing. <laughs> we have these contaminants, not just glyphosate, but plastics as well. They're certainly decreasing fertility. It impacts um, it when you eat it when you're pregnant, it goes down through the placenta into the child. So I sent a baby tooth actually off of, from my, of my daughter. I didn't know about this glyphosate problem when I was pregnant with her. She lost her baby tooth. I sent it into the lab and it came back positive for glyphosate. So that means that who knows where else that is in her body, probably all throughout the body. Um, a very, uh, still on the fertility front, some scientists did a study that showed that increased levels of glyphosate in um, second trimester women who were pregnant um, was actually connected to an increased distance between the anus and the vagina in um, the girl fetuses. So it's actually changing and androgenizing the babies of women who are eating this while they're pregnant. Just the, the, it, it, it contributes to kidney disease, liver disease. And of course, the big headliner is non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which has been all the Roundup trials. So it's really a huge problem. And what's so stunning is that, every, as I say, it almost literally is every single day, research comes out on this as published peer-reviewed research. I've had the opportunity two times to go to the Office of Pesticide Programs at the EPA with a group of scientists and present, okay, this is the research that shows these things are happening, the microbiome, all of this. Um, and each time they've called that evidence anecdotal and shut the door to discussion. So they have no intention of stopping this herbicide. And what drives me crazy about that is that that puts the onus on us and people like you, thank goodness that you're, you're willing to put this on your podcast because it's going to have to be a consumer driven change. It's clearly. Absolutely. And one of the big problems with the government agencies is they're taking <clears throat> millions of dollars from the industry. So they're taking money from the big ag, the big food producers, the pharmaceutical companies, right? They're taking this money. So they are beholden to those giant corporations and those giant industries. And uh, the, the public, the American public, thinks the EPA is there to protect them. And they're really not. They're really protecting the interests of these you know, multinational corporations, right? It's big pharma, big ag, big food, big tobacco. You know, big, big tobacco is on the decline, but these big tobacco companies actually own the big food companies now. Yeah. RJ Reynolds and, and uh, uh, Philip Morris. I mean, yeah, they've bought up these, you know, the big food companies. So, you know, they're not stupid. No. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a real big problem. And I'm, I'm glad to have you on because at the end of the day, we cannot trust the government to take care of our health, like period. Like you Absolutely. cannot trust- Absolutely, cannot in any capacity. Yeah. I, and I actually think this is what I was most surprised about. So one of the things that I did when I was first in this glyphosate journey is I went to see the cancer trials because I'm just outside of San Francisco and I went and saw them and I blogged every day of what was happening there because other places weren't talking about it in mainstream media. And my shock, I, I don't know why I was so naive before, but maybe once again, it takes something really earth shattering to open your eyes. But the extent to which the EPA is collaborating <laughs> with Monsanto all through this development and reversing decisions on carcinogenicity um, at the request of the cash that's talking is really outrageous. And so now I have zero hope in what our government's doing for our health. And, but in that being said, I've had, um, I've worked a, a bit with Cory Booker and his team. There's someone who actually is doing, he sees what the issue is and he's trying to make his move, but how much can you really do when you're one or two people in the Senate? You can't really influence that much. So it's very frustrating to try and impact that policy. It really is. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we just have to educate consumers, right? If you just educate people, hey, don't buy these foods, right? Avoid these foods. If, if you want to avoid glyphosate, right? It's up to you. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because they're going to, you know, the, the government will let food producers sell you almost anything. They'll let drug producers sell you almost anything. And uh, with very little, very little actual unbiased regulatory 
uh, supervision and uh, and so you know we're left with you know a public that's assuming that if it's on the market it's safe and effective right yeah in terms of drugs or if it's on the market as a as a food product that it's safe and not contaminated what bothers me the most lately over the last whatever number of years are the environmentalists who were so obsessed with co2 and couldn't care less about glyphosate oh. you know it's it's all about climate change and global warming we got to reduce greenhouse gases and co2 such as this huge problem which co2 isn't even toxic to humans and plants love co2 right <laughs> Uh, but they're not paying any attention to glyphosate or atrazine. Atrazine was proven to uh, turn, you know, basically induce sex changes in That's frogs. True. Tyrone. <laughs> Tyrone Hayes. I mean, the, and you know what? That's still the number two used or, uh, pesticide that we have that's used. And it's in the water, is in our food, traces of it. And, you know, it's always very controversial to to talk about gender identity, but you do kind of wonder, I mean, it, it would be strange not to wonder there are changes that are happening in a parallel fashion in animals. So, you know, what is yeah. this? If this chemical is causing sex organ mutations in nature, it's not that far fetched to assume it's ca it's causing some problems in humans. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, so yeah, that's, I mean, again, another example of even, you know, these environmental organizations, and what's funny is if, if they could just realize too, a lot of those organizations aren't ready to take that thought to the soil and the soil health and the fact that if you can, you know, restore organic matter in the soil, you are going to have a decrease in carbon, but that's too big of a leap. But why is our soil so damaged? Well, because of these freaking chemicals that are spraying all over them, you know, and it's such an obvious thing, but I think big ag just try and keep, tries to keep that very quiet. Yeah, you've got the well, and you got two two things happening at once. Really, you've got the agriculture industry industry spraying you know toxic pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and then you've got the manufacturing industry just dumping all kinds of chemicals you know, into the air and soil and water. And so, yeah, I mean, it's coming it's coming from so many sources, and that should be the number one priority of anybody that really cares about the environment, right? Your number one priority is like let's stop polluting. Like, don't worry about greenhouse gases. Let's stop, like, actually polluting the environment with, you know, all these toxic chemicals. But anyway, that's a rabbit trail. The point is... <laughs> that, sounds, uh, that sounds like what I think about every day, Chris. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 I'm, I always like to, to present solutions, right? I'm not a person that just wants to, to talk about problems and scare people, right? Obviously, this is a problem. Glyphosate is harmful to human health. It can cause cancer. There's ongoing litigation, Correct on the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma thing. Yep. It's still going. I mean, the, most of them have been settled, but because Bayer is refusing to take it off the market, there's still going to be uh, cases perpetu in perpetuity, I would think. Plenty and of it has been sites. banned in other countries, correct? Um, yeah, it has been. Although not as much as I might think. I actually thought more of Europe was not using it, but now that they're looking at re-registering it, I was like, oh wait, actually France, for example, they use plenty of glyphosate. I had thought that that was not the case. So, but Germany is seeking to ban it for sure. Mexico is seeking to ban it. That's a huge controversy that's happening right now where Mexico doesn't want to import our GMO corn anymore or glyphosate. Good for them. And so Good. here comes our State Department and USDA saying, no, you better, or else we're going to make it painful for you. So that's a big thing going on right now. Yeah. And again, they're in the pocket, right? Totally. Those in the pocket. agencies are in the pockets of the big. Uh, ag producers and now they're threatening mexico you, yeah. you know, like you better take our poisonous grains <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah like are you are you're going to have uh, you know we're going to make it difficult for you to do other trade other goods yeah. yeah it's so corrupt it's just crazy but okay so let's talk about solutions okay. right um let's talk about what uh, the simple things that people can do to reduce or you know, close to eliminate their exposure to glyphosate. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing is definitely eat as organically as you possibly can. That's true. Like across the board, a lot of times you'll find that the organic foods are also more nutrient dense, though not always, but oftentimes. And eating organically is going to get rid of most exposures. And you'll see critics that also say sometimes you do find glyphosate 
in organic food, which sometimes you do, though it's, oh, I've never seen it be particularly high levels of it. So that's really the first and foremost thing you can do. Uh, and let me just interject here because uh, it's true. There can be traces of pesticides and fungicides and herbicides and, and stuff in organic food that's not supposed to be there. But at the end of the day, unless you're willing to grow every single thing you eat in your backyard, right? The be the next best thing is is trusting the organic label. <laughs> you know, so it's not you. perfect, but it's the best thing you got aside from growing every single thing you eat. <laughs> so I converted my front yard into and it's not I do not have a big front yard. I live in suburbia, but I'm now growing like you know, a few things. I'm like, oh man, if only I was one of those people that could self-sustain and grow things, that would be awesome. I know that's a growing trend that I'm jealous of. Do you grow your food? We do not grow all our own food. No, absolutely not. Now I have a tower garden oh, and, uh, and I've grown a ton of leafy greens with that thing over the years and I love it. Oh, nice. Um, it's so satisfying. So, yes. No, it's fun. And we're looking forward to uh, to, we, we moved recently and we have a little bit more, we have a bigger backyard now with more sunshine where I used to live. I just, there was too much tree cover and I couldn't really grow anything. It was really difficult. So we're looking forward to growing more of our own food now. Um, but anyway, so, okay, let's continue on with, okay. with, you know, so number one, eat organic as much as possible. And so that's that, step number one. And let me add means- to your point. There have been studies on humans where they put them on an all organic diet and they measure the excretion of pesticides in their urine. And after just a week, there is a dramatic drop in the amount of pesticides that humans are peeing out after they put them on an organic diet. What does that tell you? That means they're not ingesting this toxic stuff and they stop eventually they're, you know, your body will flush it out if you stop putting it in. So that's good news. I love that news. Thank you for bringing that up. I haven't thought about that one in a while. It doesn't make you feel quite so hopeless. You don't have to be completely wrapped up with this in perpetuity. Yeah. Um, And I'll post a link to that study in the show notes for anybody who wants to read it. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's amazing too. And then I saw a study where then someone had a piece of pizza and the glyphosate, you know, spiked right back up to an all time. So, but it is nice. It's a thing you can manage. You can make that decision for yourself. Am I going to eat that or not? You know, um, Another thing, of course, along the same line, if, if not an organic label, there are, um, it's excellent, of course, to go to your local farmer's market and talk to the farmers directly and figure out what they're using. And usually they're very honest about it. I've, there are people that have told me, oh, I still use these sprays. I'm hoping not to. And then you can decide out of what those fresh options are. Um, because sometimes the, getting that organic label is too tedious and expensive for farmers. I mean, it's not really that expensive, but it is a big process. It's a big commitment. And so they may not be using pesticides, but just don't have the label. Now that's probably yeah, not and true. Some farmers, they don't want the government coming and inspecting their property because they just, you know, have that attitude toward the government, right? Yeah. yeah with good reason. And if you're, or if you're, <laughs> if you seek the certified organic certification, uh, then yeah, you're subject to government inspections and things. So I, I can totally relate to that. Oh yeah, completely. Um, So that's the other way. So dietary exposure, of course, with other types of exposure, which are not good either. And that's what a lot of this cancer development, the non-Hodgkin lymphoma is, is from dermal exposure. And so you want to be sure that, for example, there's a big problem still at schools. Your kids may be exposed to the pesticides. I have someone reach out to me at least once a week with horror because one of those signs has been posted and I don't think even all states require it, but in California, they do a sign has been posted that they're going to be spraying glyphosate, you know, in two days. So be aware, you know, it doesn't go away. Um, glyphosate doesn't just disappear in whatever they're saying in those two days, it still remains there and having any kind of dermal exposure to it can definitely be harmful. And that's true also with pets. So if a sidewalk has been sprayed with Roundup, you definitely don't want to be taking your dogs for a walk there. So I, I have a neighbor who still sprays it. And I'm just looking at this, wondering why, because it's not like it's huge property. You could hand pick out the weeds. And so I'll take my dog on a, a walk um, a different direction so that their paws aren't exposed. Um, so you know, we're that, the same way. If we're walking our dog and we see the, the sprayed, you know, the just sprayed sign. <laughs> we're like, right? don't, don't get on that grass. <laughs> no, totally. I know. Yeah. 
and I and I have by my garden. I was thinking that I have a sign that's like no pesticides, and it totally embarrasses my daughter. By the way, she's like, "That's so Karen that you have that sign up there." I'm like, well, I just want people to feel comfortable when they walk their dog. That's nice. No, I would appreciate that for sure. Okay, there we go. Now, how long does it stay in the soil? Oh gosh, it can stay in the soil soil for years and years, and particularly in clay soil, um, which a lot of land is clay soil. It can stay in there for years. I know in order to get organic certification, um, you can't use glyphosate on the farm property for three years because that's what, what the time is in general. I, and I think that's just a broad estimation. But uh, the metabolite AMPA will stay in that soil for some time. And if you have a sidewalk or concrete that's sprayed, it will stay there until a rain comes and can wash it away. Um, so yeah, it, it stays around, unfortunately. A lot it's, of people think that the uh, non-GMO label is a healthy, you know, the non-GMO project, that this is a healthy designation. Uh, do you want to talk about that? Oh, my gosh. So that makes me so sad because when I was first getting into eating more healthfully, I was like, oh, this is great. This is an amazing non-GMO project. We've all seen that that sticker on there. So it probably I is. too. I, right? I mean, and it was an accomplishment even to get that so widely used. And I think when GMOs first came out, I'm not super psyched about GMOs. I don't go down that path because I have to kind of focus. Um, but in terms of what the health impacts are from ingesting uh, GMO, whatever it is. So what does that have to do with the body? The sort of a separate issue also concerning. Um, but what people don't realize if they're buying non-GMO, it definitely does not mean that glyphosate hasn't been sprayed or other pesticides. It just strictly means that there are no GMO products in it. So uh, some of those would be like high fructose corn syrup, um, various soys, a lot of the fillers will be GMO. And so you don't want to buy something that doesn't say non-GMO, but it doesn't help prevent the chemical exposures that are in that product. Yeah, non-GMO, right. Non-GMO products can, A, they don't have to be organic. A lot of times they're not organically grown. They can be sprayed with every pesticide, herbicide, fungicide available, <laughs> basically, yeah. and still have the non-GMO label on them. So yeah, don't be fooled by it. It really doesn't mean anything unless that product is certified organic and non-GMO, but it doesn't even have to have the non-GMO label if it's certified organic. Yeah, because... I feel bad for brands that are feeling like they have to purchase both just because of that misunderstanding. If it's organic, it's not GMO. Right. That's by definition. Uh, organic products cannot be, uh, cannot have genetically modified ingredients. And you know, you you're only seeing that on processed food and packaged food anyway, right? They're not putting non-GMO stickers on apples. That's a really so, good point yet <laughs> yeah, huh? it could happen but um but yeah the less the less food you're buying in in packages right in boxes and cans and bags and whatnot the less likely you are to be exposed to all kinds of food additives anyway mm -hmm. so focusing your attention on the produce aisle uh and filling up your cart with produce as opposed to processed food is definitely a better strategy oh absolutely and it's interesting too that Food, there are issues with meat and being labeled non-GMO, GMO. GMO. Um, and Chipotle actually ran into this a few years ago when they had a big, big campaign. Is like, we're non-GMO, all of our ingredients. Well, it turned out that their meat was actually being fed. Those animals were being fed GMO grain. So the, <laughs> the animals were eating all those chemicals and we know that they bioaccumulate and then you're eating them. And so that really didn't seem quite accurate. So now that's a big gray area. And I think... Um, at least in Europe, where they seem to be even more concerned about GMOs, as soon as there's a label that goes on that says fed GMO feed, I think that Europeans will rapidly find that concerning and want to change that and hopefully drive down the demand for our disgusting GMO corn and soy that we send over there. Did anything change at Chipotle or not? No. Well, what's really weird is that when they had that huge launch, around exactly the same time as the big campaign and billboards, that's when there was the very odd E. coli breakout in all the Chipotles around the country that- I remember that. Remember that? And then suddenly the non-GMO campaign went away and I've looked all over to figure out, okay, has anyone been talking about this? But no, I mean, it just seems fishy to me. That is, that is kind of interesting actually, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> What foods have the highest levels of 
glyphosate generally? Generally, it is these these grains. You'll see really high level in in sprayed wheat and in um, you know hummus from the chickpeas. Those are usually very high levels. Chocolate can have a lot too because they're quite excited those farmers to use glyphosate on chocolate. Um, the there was an interesting study recently, actually, that Moms Across America did of different chocolate types. So that's something that could be checked out if, if you're a big chocolate fan. Uh, but and the thing is with glyphosate specifically, it's going to be different because I know uh, with the Dirty Dozen that EWG puts out, a lot of times it isn't glyphosate that's the issue on those fruits because you can't spray glyphosate on them or else they would die. Um, so with glyphosate, I think more of the grains. Yeah, beans and grains. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and actually yeah, and orange then, juice too, oranges and nuts because the, and wine, um, the rows in between in orchards, they will oftentimes spray down, um, in between the trees and then it goes down through the soil in through the roots and up into the fruit. That's interesting. Yeah. And I'd heard about the wine issue, but I hadn't really heard about oranges. Um, yeah, folks. I mean, and we'll link to this too. the e, the EWG Dirty Dozen list. I, I talk about this in my book. It's been they've been doing this for a long time. But every year they look at the the USDA report of the cleanest and the most contaminated produce in terms of pesticides, and then they they rank them. You know, and so they've got the Clean Fifteen and the Dirty Dozen, and then there's a bunch in between. But the Clean Fifteen is a list of fruits and vegetables. Uh, that have the lowest levels of pesticides that you could, you know, generally speaking, buy conventional. And uh, the Dirty Dozen would be the worst that you definitely, definitely should buy organic. And the Dirty Dozen, is, it's almost always the same list. I mean, it's like apples and onions and berries. You know, they're always, the, the, the fruits and vegetables that you are eating uh well, to say it a different way, the safe ones are the ones where you don't eat the skin, mm. right? So oranges, right? Lemons, limes, cantaloupe, melons. You're not eating the skin, pineapple. So uh, those are safe. Er. Yeah, safer. <laughs> They're cleaner. Uh, and, but if you're eating the skin, like berries, like apples, then um, tomatoes, then yeah, you are ingesting more pesticides mm -hmm. if you're not buying organic. So that's a great resource. We'll link to it. If, if you, if this is new to you and you've never heard of it, just a great little, they have an app. You can go to the grocery store and just pull up the app and kind of pick and choose and save some money that way. Cause organic can be expensive. Shoot. When I started eating organic in 2004, when I had cancer, it was like, it was really expensive. Oh, it must and have been that. Yeah. That was before I was. It was, it was, it was high. There was only one, basically one grocery store in town. The, the whole foods was like the only place that had organic produce the major grocery stores didn't have it and or if they did it was a tiny little section and yeah and you, we were paying a lot it was just it was i had sticker shock for sure when i first started eating 100 percent organic now it's so much better i mean lord costco's got a huge selection of organic produce and every grocery store has it and it's it's a lot better and it's a lot less expensive because it's being produced in such large quantities now so that's a good thing i love costco for that I love Costco for the fact that they got rid of selling Roundup and that they provide that option of affordable organic eating. That's awesome. I didn't know that they got rid of Roundup. Yeah, awesome. isn't that awesome? Great. Yeah, they said not us. Now if Home Depot could follow too. I have a, I have an article actually I'll share it of the the my favorite things we buy at Costco. I'll put it in the show notes, but it's it's a bunch oh, of nice. food items. And I'm sure these things rotate constantly, but I'm I, I put this article together years ago, but it's, you know, we buy a lot of organic food at Costco. And, and in fact, today I had a fruit smoothie for lunch and it was organic blueberries and organic mixed berries it's and, uh, from Costco yeah. <laughs> and organic hemp hearts. Like, so yeah. The organic peanut butter ingredients. is really good there. <laughs> for a long time, they had the gluten-free organic ramen that I loved and then that went away, but you're right. Things rotate there, but then it's heartbreaking. <laughs> yep. We like to stroll the aisles. Yeah, for sure. We'll stroll the aisles and see like what's new. Yeah. Cause you know, sometimes, right. They'll get rid of something great. Cause they had organic almonds and walnuts for a while. And then yeah, they, they did. Now they don't, at least in, at my Costco. Yeah. Me I too. mean the closest one to me, but, um, but yeah, no, it really is. They really have a great selection of stuff. So it's not that hard and it's not that expensive or even necessarily 
the amount of money you spend is negligible yeah. uh, uh, on, on organic food. So that's very encouraging. Um, okay, so in terms of, you know, glyphosate progress or like what's next? What are you researching right now? Um, I mean, like what are you most passionate about? So I spent a, a lot of the last year working towards the White House Conference on Nutrition that happened um, to get toxicities on their radar. And that didn't go very well because it didn't, the, the conference happened and no one discussed farming practices or toxicity of food, simply food access. Okay. That, that was the outcome of that. Just so, so demoralizing. And so uh, there are a group of us that scream about these things a lot. And so we, um, and we actually had hope because the USDA has been recently diverting a lot of money towards regenerative agriculture and organic agriculture, which is huge. And I heard Tom Vilsack say that his, his grandson can't have two servings of dairy because it makes him sick. And I was like, okay, so maybe his attitude is starting to change because it's impacting him personally, which is, I think, what needs to happen to make the change. Um, and so what I'm finding is there, and I, I enjoy doing, is that there are a lot of small brands of different foods that are popping up and they're organic. And a lot of them are trying to employ regenerative um, agriculture practices, which aren't necessarily organic, but it's, it's soil healing. And those people are really having a hard time getting funding or even pushing through because the, the sales story of that with a brand of, oh, you know, this is why you should spend more for this product is really a hard sell when people aren't even aware that glyphosate or these other chemicals are being sprayed in the first place. Um, so I'm enjoying that because I do think it's going to come from the consumer side. Um, and the more brands that are enticing that can compete and the more options that there are, it's, gen it's going to make the producers more inclined to adopt these clean practices. But it's, it's such a nascent industry. Like, you know, it's like a handful of companies that are really doing this. And frustratingly, there isn't this regenerative label that you might start seeing around is definitely a point of greenwashing from large companies and, and actually some small companies that don't realize they're greenwashing, but you know, they might do one thing, like put some cover crops into a farm and say, well, now we're regenerative when really there's so much more to it than that. And so I think empowering these consumers, both with our, our money and our attention and whatever we can do to support them, these, these brands is going to be a huge thing. So that's mostly what I'm focusing on these days. I also um, have my eyes open for alternatives to glyphosate, because one thing in talking to a lot of farmers um, who use glyphosate, very well-meaning people that don't see that there's a huge problem, but they do see that there's a lot of pressure from consumers and from places like General Mills to stop using it. And so what then what does a farmer do at that point? They don't want to go back to straight cutting and doing the more difficult way of harvest. So what are non-toxic alternatives maybe that they could use in the short term while adopting regenerative practices? And that's an area that is just, you know, I, I love interacting with these people that are all just trying to do the right thing, but be able to make money doing it because that's the only way that we're going to move forward, I think. Are there any large companies or corporations that are moving in the right direction, in your opinion? Um, I mentioned General Mills. They definitely are. They are doing the right kinds of things and trying to decrease pesticide use, which is great. There's a small group in yeah, there that, is, that great. is focused on that. I've been really impressed because certain members of um, the Walton family with Walmart are also getting really engaged in, in healing our soil. Um, and that would be very huge to have Walmart on board with that. And even Target, to a certain extent, is starting to pay attention to that. I've seen some of their labels changing and, and clearly the consumers are wanting to buy it. So that makes me happy too. And you've probably seen some of their other non-toxic cleaning products. I just love seeing it. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely been a big boon. I, again, back to 2004. Yeah. You couldn't get any non-toxic cleaning products and oh, yeah. what were you doing? Just vinegar? Yeah. You know, I mean, whole foods had some stuff, right? Oh yeah. They had, they, they definitely had some non-toxic products, but yeah, it was like none of the other stores did. So that's huh. come a long way. Now it's like, 
there's more. I mean, it's like, it seems like every day someone's asking me, it's about some new brand, you know, what about this brand? What about that brand? Like, I don't know. I can't even keep up now. There's so many brands that, that are uh, claiming to be non-toxic and eco-friendly and all that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that, that's, I, that's encouraging. It's nice to see positive progress. And it is, I think, coming from consumer demand. Yeah. And corporations are, they're wising up. I mean, they're like, look, people want it. We can make money on it. Like, I've got no problem with somebody, you know, selling me something I want. <laughs> you totally, know what I'm right? It's so true. Like, yeah. Like, just make it, you know, make what I want. I'll buy it from you. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. <laughs> And the premium yeah. that those farmers can get, you know, there are farmers right now with this Mexico GMO situation, they're saying this is a great opportunity to subsidize this type of non-chemical corn growing. Why aren't you putting money into that instead of fighting Mexico for it? Like we would like to change. So there is that element too. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a big, that's a big factor for sure. Yeah. Well, um, this has been really interesting and I know it's going to be so helpful for folks and, and, you know, again, at the end of the day, it, if you focus on the, the simple things, right, this, there's a simple solution to this. If you focus on eating a diet that's predominantly organic, right, and eating whole food and eating at home, yeah, right, home, yeah. Uh, you are going to avoid or uh, you're going to dramatically reduce your exposure to toxic and harmful pesticides. Glyphosate is just one of them. But, but buying organic and, and making food at home, right? Making your own breakfast at home, making your lunch, taking it with you to work instead of eating at fast food or whatever, uh, making dinner instead of getting takeout. Like, yeah, it takes a little more time. And yes, takeout's convenient. And yes, the, there's a lot of restaurants that make food that tastes great. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> like, I get it. But, um, but, but, you know, over time, uh, if you have health problems now, uh, this will help you hopefully resolve health problems, right? Mm -hmm. That are caused by poor nutrition or toxic nutrition. And, uh, and if you're relatively healthy, Hey, it'll help you avoid developing chronic disease. And, uh, so there's a lot of good reasons to do it. And it doesn't mean you can never eat out ever again. Um, but even when you're eating out, you know, we focus on, we eat a plant-based diet anyway. So like we focus on just eating fruits and vegetables and eating veggie, veggie plates and stuff. When we go out, if we go to a nice restaurant, I'll, or I'll order vegetables, you Do know, you look at and, that uh, vegetable and think, I wonder what's on it. I don't, I, I, I used to, yeah, I, would like I used to, not. to, I would like yeah, to not think I, that. I just have to turn it off. But when I had cancer, I didn't even like, I didn't eat out anywhere. You know, I mean, I didn't trust any food. It was like, I'm, I'm I picked the food from the grocery store or from the market. I brought it home. I made it. I ate it. And I knew exactly what I was eating, you know, as much yeah. as one could. Um, now that I'm almost 20 years past my diagnosis, I'm still really, you know, I still, my health still a big priority because I'm only 45 and I plan on living at least another 45, 50 years. You know? Me too. But, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, like if we're going out to eat, I'm just like, I just turn off that part of my brain. I'm like, I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to order vegetables cause I love to eat vegetables anyway and have a good veggie plate and just not worry about, you know, it's, it's not organic, right? I know it's not. So I just, <laughs> just like, I'm just going to enjoy it. It's cool. It's, you know, this is not the way I eat normally. I know. And I think that's the thing, right? I'm like, okay. So I would say because I want to have a social life, I am probably 70% organic and 30% not. And I wish I was more, but the truth is it becomes also like a psychological toll when, when you're unwilling to eat out just the way it is. Yeah. And what we tell folks in our community that are trying to heal is like, you don't have to, you know, be a prisoner of your own home, eat before you go. Yeah, right? absolutely. You can, you can totally go to social events, go out to eat, go to potlucks, go whatever, go to family and friends houses, but just eat before you go or bring your food with you. It's cool. Like, it's a little weird in a restaurant, you know, to do that. So you eat before you go if it's a restaurant. But if it's like a get together with family, just bring your own stuff. Oh yeah, and that you know what? When yeah. I was sick, I would carry around a huge thermos with like my smoothie, and people just knew that's what it was. And thank goodness, I mean, that was not a time that I explored. But when you're sick, you do what you need to do, and don't feel embarrassed about it. It's so true. Right. Yep. I, I brought my giant salads with me everywhere, and um, yeah. So. It's not hard if you just plan it, plan, plan ahead a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. It just takes a little bit of planning, a little bit of prioritizing to, you know, shift your daily food routine 
And, uh, and once you kind of just get over that little bit of a learning curve, that little hump, mm -hmm. it gets easier and just becomes, it becomes your normal routine. Like, like I don't even think about that stuff anymore. Yeah. It's just the way we live, the way we eat, you know, the way we shop, whatever. So that's the good news folks. Like it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be difficult. Don't be intimidated. You know, just being aware is the first step and then making different choices at the grocery store. I mean, my best advice is if you don't want to eat it, don't buy it. That's so true. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like if it's in the house, like don't, don't, don't kid yourself that you have that much willpower. You know, That's if it's so in your, true. in your pantry and you bought it for some other family member, like, like you're probably going to eat it too. Well, I, I, you know, recently, um, Oreo came out with a gluten-free Oreo and Oreo was my thing, like before getting sick. And I stared sure. at it. I stared at it. I finally bought it because I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna have an Oreo, yay, yay!" And then I threw it away when I got home. <laughs> it was didn't a really emotional thing for me. Didn't even have one. Because no. then you, I was like, "I'm just gonna read the ingredients to remind myself why I don't have these." Right? I mean, that ingredient list. Holy cow! That's like the odd. <laughs> There's nothing real in it. Nothing. Yeah. No. That's well, like and Reese's peanut butter cups. I, unless I'm losing my mind, unless I am I'm hallucinating or imagine this or something, I think I saw that they have organic. Reese's peanut butter cups. Yes, they do. I saw that. Okay. But you know what? They yeah. weren't that good. Really? Yeah. They didn't taste the same? <laughs> no. I was so bummed. That is disappointing. That's, there, there's that's... that other brand that, you know, I just, Justin's. That I, that yeah, Justin's. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll get those occasionally as a little treat. Yeah. Uh, I want to buy the Reese's just to support them, just to say like, I know, hey, and I did too. here's some dollars. Like, that's great that you're trying to do something. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, they also came out with the Hershey's Hershey's bar that was organic. I was like, "Oh, this is awesome!" So I bought them for s'mores, and around there, and it like didn't melt. I mean, I you know that you can Weird. do organic chocolate fine, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. But I too want to support it, so you know, go ahead and try it. I may have a different taste bud. That is, yeah. Well, you know, I think I'm, I'm encouraged, but it is a, it is a real problem. I mean, glyphosate is a real problem, right? Yeah. It's a real problem. It is toxic. It can cause cancer. It can wreck your gut. It can, I mean, we didn't even really get into all of the chronic diseases glyphosate can cause, but just a few of them, it's like inflammation, right? If you have mysterious inflammation, if you have thyroid problems, if you have chronic f fatigue or fibromyalgia yeah. symptoms, you know, like there's a long list of chronic illness or chronic conditions that can be caused by or exacerbated by toxic pollutants in our environment, including glyphosate. So, you know, uh, that just, I guess it just goes without saying, like if you, you know, if you're sick and you don't know why, or if you feel bad and you don't know why you have no energy, you're, you're, you're sore, you got arthritis, you're inflamed, whatever, like start by cleaning up your diet. Absolutely. Number one. And, you know, it, it's hard to believe that we even have to say that because it seems like it should be so obvious, but it was not obvious to me because doctors put no priority on that at all. In fact, I started having stomach problems. They didn't ask me what I was eating. I mean, it's just, it's not on their mind. And when you have these highly trained doctors that aren't putting it in your mind and they're suggesting other things and tests and drugs and everything, it's, it's hard not to believe them. But certainly... You and I can attest to the fact that cleaning up that diet is immensely impactful and your body wants to heal. Like it, it wants that. Yeah. And you think, if you think about it this way, it's like, it's hard to heal when you keep injuring yourself over and over and over, right? If you keep slamming your elbow on the wall, like it'll never get well, right? <laughs> it'll stay bruised and sore if you just keep hitting it every day in the same spot. And like, we're doing that internally, right? We're injuring ourselves internally with the food we ingest and it, you don't feel the injury, right? You don't feel it like, oh, I just swallowed it and now I'm in pain. Right. Yeah. But those tiny molecules, right. Are circulating in your blood and, and, and into your tissues and your cells and they're causing problems. And over time, the problem, you know, it's like the snowball effect, right? The problems, uh, or the symptoms manifest and increase. And uh, it's hard to imagine like, what, what's the big deal? It's just this one, you know, this one meal or this one, whatever food item, like, or this sugary drink or something like, it's hard to imagine that that's contributing to your symptoms. But in so many cases, it is. Yeah. So yeah, I love what you said. It's, you know, it can take a long time to, to finally realize like, wait a minute, maybe 
it's the food because doctors are not trained in prevention or healing. No, right? they're not trained at all in helping people do that. They're trained in treating disease. And most of that is with surgery or drugs. And in many cases, the treatment doesn't cure you. It alleviates the pain. It makes your symptoms less so you can live with your disease. And um, that's not good. Right? No. It's like that's that's not the optimal solution. The optimal solution is like, wait a minute. What's the cause of your stomach problem, right? What is causing yes. it? What, why do you have it in the first place? Right. There's, we live in a question. cause and effect world, right? This is science. There, we cause and effect. Yeah. And I don't want to demonize doctors. I mean, the reality is they're not trained. That's not their fault. No. Uh, it's medical education. And two, they're, the medical system is so broken that they're just slammed. I mean, they're overworked. They, they're seeing 40, 50 patients a day. I mean, they don't have time to sit down and spend quality time with the patient to really talk through their life and yeah. really research what are the causes, what are the contributing factors to this person's illness. They, they don't have time to do that. I mean, there's some that make the time and they're, they're my favorite doctors, but I know, I've interviewed I love that. many of those types of doctors, you know, and holistic and integrated. Usually they doctors. don't take insurance. Yeah. And ins insurance is set up, is not set up to reimburse doctors for giving that level of care. Yeah. So it, it really, you know, it's a, it's a multifactorial problem, but at the end of the day, no one's going to take better care of you than you, if you decide to do it. And that means you have to take ownership for your health and your disease, and you have to be willing to read and research and you have to be willing to, to kind of shrug your shoulders and admit, you know, maybe I don't know anything about this and I need to learn something. Yeah, there is that. <laughs> you know? Maybe I need to learn and listen to people who've healed name a chronic condition, right? Who've healed and put their testimonials out there online on YouTube or written books about it. Maybe I need to do that. And, uh, that's and a I powerful thing to, to do. Myself. And people should do more of that because when I was sick, I was looking far and wide for any kind of testimonials when you're really lost and you feel like you're alone and no doctor understands that kind of thing is so valuable. So when you find yourself on the other side, it's a really nice way to pay back, you know, the community when, cause other people will have your same problems. That's right. I mean, this is what got you started on, you know, uh, uh, sharing your story and started your platform. This is what got me started was sharing my recovery from cancer. It's why I am constantly interviewing people who've healed cancer, all types and stages, mm -hmm. right? Because it's, you know, you and I are not just flukes. No, we're not just, we didn't just get better because we're lucky. Like we took deliberate action to help ourselves. Right. And first thing that was the first thing both of us did changing our diet, right? <laughs> it is. like the very first thing I did. So, um, anyway, Kelly, this has been super fun. I thank you so much for your time. Where can people f follow you and connect with you? Um, so I am at glyphosate girl, um, on Instagram and on Twitter, though I'm not on Twitter all that often. So Instagram is the place to find me. And my website is glyphosate facts. Dot com and you can get a good overview of what the issues are by the state on that site. That's awesome. And is there any political action type stuff through that site? So right now, actually in my bio, there is a petition to sign, which would be awesome for those who could go do it through Regenerate America. They're putting together a big push to try and change the farm bill that is going to be um, passed this year, so in 2023, to include more regenerative organic agriculture in it so that our government dollars can start going to actually healing us instead of just putting more chemicals into our environment. Yeah, that's good. I, I will make sure and link to you, you know, your all of your social media and your website and everything in the show notes for everybody that wants to to connect with you and follow you and, and be take some action, right? To, yeah. To hopefully, it's really hard. You know, it's really hard to influence public policy, but, you know, if you're doing nothing, you're definitely not, you're definitely doing nothing. Right? <laughs> so, so like we hope that, yeah, we hope that, that petitioning and I, and I just want to thank you for the work that you're doing because you're not just blogging about it. I mean, you're actually going and speaking and testifying, right. And trying to influence influential people, Try. right. It, who are making decisions that affect me and everybody listening. And so that takes a lot of time and energy and effort. And uh, so, you know, the, the, that kind of work and sacrifice is not lost on me. So I just want to thank you personally for doing that. Oh, thanks for saying that. It's really nice. Yeah, it's a, it's a lot of work and it is free. 
work that I'm doing. No one pays me for it. Yeah, it's it's a, a largely a thankless job that pays you nothing. That's what, <laughs> so, that's, that's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> but you feel good no, at thank night. Thank you. Thank you for that. Cause that, that means a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> hopefully you feel good at night. Yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna add one more thing before we jump off, which is you know earlier. I mean, this is a brand new news story that I shared on Facebook a few days ago this week, so it's timely. But the EPA recently gave Chevron, uh, a, a Chevron refinery in Mississippi, the green light to create fuel, like, an, like a recycled eco-friendly fuel, okay, from discarded plastics as part of this climate-friendly initiative to, uh, to create alternatives to petroleum fuel. Now, that sounds pretty good so far, right? Okay, well, we can recycle plastic and make a, a, a fuel out of it, like a biofuel, you know, whatever, uh, instead of petroleum, cool, uh, except according to the agency records, the production of one of these types of fuels can emit air pollution that's so toxic <laughs> that, wait a minute, wait for it, that one out of four people exposed to it over a lifetime could get cancer. What? One out of four people? Yeah. Yeah. One out of four. And the risk is 250,000 times greater than the level that's usually considered acceptable by the EPA oh my God. division that approves new chemicals. <laughs> I mean, okay. how? I'll send you the link. Please I'll, do. And folks, I'll, Please send I'll post the link in the show notes. But yeah, I mean, this, this oh is God. the kind of insanity that the, the eco-friendly movement and the climate change movement, they're pushing forward these alternatives. Petroleum so terrible. I'm not saying it's great. I mean, petroleum so terrible. Let's make fuel out of plastic that, that causes, you know, that has a 250,000 higher cancer risk. Oh, so please send that to me. That is really appalling. I mean, I'm yeah, laughing we should have, because it's so appalling. Yeah, it is. It's it's shocking. It's like absurdly shocking. And I should have opened the podcast with that information because that's a pretty good hook, right? Yeah, but anyway, that's really good. We're we're rewarding the people that hung in there till the end. <laughs> <laughs> I totally with that. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody again. Thank you, Kelly. Appreciate you so much. Thanks for and, having uh, me. Thanks for watching. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everybody. Thanks for listening. And um, please share this information. Everyone needs to know the the world. There's not a citizen on earth that doesn't need to know about the harms of glyphosate and that you can reduce or eliminate your exposure by just choosing different food, organic food. So let's spread the word. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.